leaving a church legacy. What God has, I, I feel God has detonated into my spirit and my heart. Really a week, two weeks, or well, no, it was a week ago. It was on Monday. And just like a bomb went off in my spirit because, and it was on the heels. This is how God answers prayer. If we really get serious before God, he will answer prayer and he will give you guidance if we're really looking for it. Uh, God doesn't waste his time on rebellion and all of this sort of thing. And if we, we're not being sincere and et cetera, et cetera. And I tell you what, I really got sincere on, I, it was Monday afternoon, I guess. And I just went before the Lord and I said, God, uh, I, you know, I'm the shepherd of this house. I'm the under shepherd. He's the great shepherd, but I am a pastor. That's what pastor means is shepherding. And I said, Lord, about my own life and where am I as, as a pastor, as a spiritual leadership of that house, you have entrusted. Uh, Lord, I, I feel like we need to be going further and, and, and transitioning, whatever the case. And I'll tell you what, uh, on the heels of that statement, it wasn't long, God began to bring revelation. And I mean, it thundered in my heart and in my soul. And how I view this is, and allow me to stumble around a little bit to catch that vein of this, but it looks to me like, just like last night, we was out eating with my youngest son and, and a friend of his. And when we left that place, we went into Food Lion down the sidewalk. And how many knows when you get to those doors, a lot of times now they have those automated doors, has a little eye on it. And you know, when you get into position, then the doors automatically go open. Am I right? Uh, you can walk up and down the sidewalk all you want, or you can walk in in other stores. But until you get into into position of that store and at that place, those doors don't open for you. But when you get into the right position and we came walking up there, the moment we got to the right place in our progression, in our walk, and then all of a sudden the doors open. Now it didn't stop there. The doors open, meaning I've granted you access into this place. But yet we had to keep walking to actually get inside and cross the threshold and partake of those things. Amen. It is the same way with God. Um, he'll open the doors and say, I'm giving you access. You have come to the place. You have grown to the place that you have to keep in mind that when you enter through the cross of Christ, it doesn't end there. You cross in. You just entered into a new lifestyle that is going to progress until the day you die. Okay? Don't just camp on the inside of the gate. That's just an entranceway. Keep on walking. <laughs> Amen? Too many times people just camp on the inside. That's not it. This is a growth. It is a walk. It is a development. And when you, it's the same way with God. It's like you keep getting to doors of revelation along the way. Things are concealed to us. Even after we're saved, there are things out in the future that is going to hinge on our maturity, our progression, our acceptance of known truth at the time that after you put it into practice now you keep walking and walking and walking next thing you know you come to another uh, vantage point or access point and once you get there the doors open and here's more revelation you walk through it you live in it a while then you grow you develop then you come to another door and that's the way that God leads us through this spiritual life so when if you're saved for 30 years you should not still be at the entrance way. <laughs> Amen. You should be long gone. I should be long gone. I should be going through all kinds of access and revelation and development. In other words, if we've been saved for 30 years, we should be acting like in the knowledge we have that we are 30 year Christians. Amen. Now, and so when I was praying this and seeing God begin to open up this into my mind's eye like a vision almost, and this church, I feel at this moment through prayer that we have come to another threshold. We've come to another place. The doors have flung open. I feel it in my spirit. Many of you feel it the same way. And we're standing there and God has said, all right, you have progressed to this point. Here is more access to more knowledge, more depth in your experience, and greater in power is accessible for you to operate in. And I feel like we as a church are right there this morning. Now all we have to do is let's just walk through it and get to where God wants to take us. Amen? Now, when, when I get into this, I, I'm going to revisit some things. A legacy. What is a legacy? Well, 
God spoke into my heart, transitioning. And I told the Lord this. I said, Lord, I feel like Mount Calvary is a good church. But, but I don't want to just be a good church. I want it to be a great church. <laughs> Thank you for three amens. How many wants it to be a great church? Amen. Now, 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 listen, here's another thing. We do not allow the world to determine what is great and what is not. The world will say that a great church is this or that. But God, His standard is different than the world's. Okay? The world will say that's a great church if it compromises and has 30,000 people in it and does very little for God. They will say, now that is a great church. God looks down and says, that's pitiful. <laughs> I used the illustration the other night that, that I'll give you an example that's biblical. I will tell you that according to modern, uh, you know, statisticians and those even in the American church world and, and those looking at churches and evaluating what is a great church, do you know they would have looked at Noah and said he was one of the worst preachers of all time? <laughs> because he only had seven in his church. <laughs> Are you hearing me? But yet Peter acclaimed and God said that Noah was one of the greatest preachers of righteousness of all time. So numbers do not validate ministry. What validates ministry is, is an uncompromising uh, spirit of integrity that is continually walking habitually with God every day that they exist. God will look down whether you have 10 people or 10,000 and he sees that. He will say, that is a great church. So first of all, if we want to be a great church, forget the world and forget the modern church world of compromise and what they say is a great church. Let's find out what God says is a great church and let us fulfill that. Amen? Now, I know people look and say, how can you be a great church in Cornfield County? Well, I want to tell you something. God can plant a church anywhere and make it a great church. I mean, it can be stuck in the bottom side of who knows where in Timbuktu and if his grace is on it, his power is there because of yielded vessels, it'll be a great church. A great church, and I wrote this, is determined by, in God's eyes, its present ability to influence and its effectiveness. Presently, I'm not talking futurely yet, and I'm getting to that, but presently, we must have the ability to influence other people outside of ourselves. If we are not influencing other people with the gospel and the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, then we are not performing the function of a real church. Come on now. You see, something you're going to learn this morning, and, and it applies to me as anybody, we're going to learn this morning that the bedrock of this thing is, you're going to see is demanding honor, humility, and growth. It's present ability to influence and its effectiveness. Its effectiveness, I, I'm not talking about how many social programs it has. I'm talking about its effectiveness in the gospel program. It is able to influence people it comes in contact with. Amen? Now, I would say as well, let me add on to this, that if something would happen to this church, if you want to know how great a church is, that if something would happen to that church, its local community would suffer and deal with a great loss because of it going out of existence. You know, it's terrible if a church burns down to the ground or something happens to a church. Forbid that happen. But it goes out and nobody takes notice. Come on now. We need to have this. Now, look at this. Ultimately, a great church is determined by its legacy of not dying out in one generation. I tell you, God put this in my heart. He, he basically told me this, this week, Reuben, you have got, you have come to your own physical age and spiritual age. You have got to start thinking generally, generationally. You've got to start thinking about the next generation and that next generation after them. This is your responsibility. And ultimately, it becomes the church's responsibility as well. We do not want to die out and leave our legacy as we existed for one generation. I don't don't know about you, but I want this church to go to the next generation, and I want that generation to experience more than we did. 
You say, well, I, oh, I don't know about that. No, listen, Jesus said that in John 14, 12. He said, not only these works shall you do, he said, and greater works than these shall you do also. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm handing something to you, and you will have the opportunity to do greater things than I did. I think that's the same thing we ought to feel, and you're going to start seeing this come around. You're going to start seeing the church. When a church starts thinking this way, they start losing the perspective that church is all about me. <laughs> Selfishness is eating us alive in the American church. It's not about me. First of all, it's all about Christ. Then after it's all about Christ, he'll, trans, he'll transfer his attitude in his mind. Is, and it's not about me, but now I spend my life for everybody else. The church isn't about me. It's about another generation coming that I've got to leave something to them. And my responsibility is heavy on me that when I leave this world, I'm leaving a baton in their hand to carry on throughout the next generation. Now... <laughs> You see, we, we got to, oh, there's this, oh boy, there's so much to coming here. And I, I'm saying things a little redundantly, but that's all right, because we have viewers here that I want to, to hear this. And I said this Wednesday night, and it about, and, and people agreed. I mean, and, and I know you will here on Sunday morning. One of the things at church, we are leaving, everything we do is leaving an example to the next generation. Am I right? Then we got to start questioning ourselves, not everybody else, ourselves. What am I leaving them? <laughs> if I'm passing, I'm going to have these guys up here in a minute, but if I'm passing a baton, see, we have to realize a church legacy is not running a sprint, it's running a relay race. <laughs> Even our personal lives, we say, oh boy, I'm running a sprint, we get to the end, that's it. No, we should have left something behind for the next generation. Are you hearing me? A church is the same way. What are we leaving behind to that next generation? This is what is said. To, all right, I'm going to get to the first one. I'm afraid that we are producing the next generation, all right, but I'm afraid it is a Saul generation. Some of you weren't here Wednesday night. Listen to this. What is a Saul generation? Do you know what the problem with King Saul was? One thing, he started out great, but then he backslid and fell out with God. But here's the thing that was interesting about him. When you're reading his story, and especially his interaction with David, and their back and forth. Saul got to a point in his life, infected with demons and everything else. He got to a point in his life that he loved worship. But he didn't like to hear the word. I'm going to bring this out this morning. I want, I want our viewers to hear that. I want everybody to hear this. Because this is a problem in America right now. We'll never become a better generation after us if this thing continues. Saul was out with God, didn't have any feelings for God anymore. But it was interesting. He loved to hear worship music. Nothing wrong with worship music. Just hear me to the end on this. And he would call David in because he was so miserable and so agitated and so irritated. He'd call David in, sit there and say, David, you play for me. Well, play. What did David play? Well, he'd play to the Lord. He played worship music on his heart. As he's worshiping God, Saul felt better. <laughs> Do you remember this? But yet, when it came time for somebody to preach to him, he didn't want to hear it. Some of you get this tomorrow, but I'm going to bring it right now. In our churches today, here's a problem. We're making a future generation drunk on worship music, and they don't want to hear the word, and we're not giving it to them. Amen. Are you hearing me? It's out of balance. What, is anything wrong with worship? Well, goodness, no. But if it gets out of balance, the word should be loved. <laughs> worship is just a setup for the word to come. <laughs> come on now. It's more than a pop sound or a pop music driving down the road beating your feet or hitting your hand on the dash. <laughs> Nothing wrong with getting excited and worshiping. Just hear what I'm saying. It's more than that. It actually has a purpose, and worship is not for the sinner. Worship, music, and song is for the saint of God. 
Come on now. But see, we're raising up a generation that's full, so full of entertainment, and we've taught them. Don't blame this next generation. We've taught them entertainment. We've taught them from the cradle to 18 that church is nothing but a pizza party and a light show, and it's just a bunch of wild banging music and no word. Then we wonder why when they get in the congregation or out in the sanctuary, I'm bored. That's why when the message is being preached, they want to get on an iPhone and play a game. Why? Because they were never taught that the Word is more important than anything else in their life. Come on now. You, you see, we, we've intoxicated people. And, and listen, you say, well, how can sinners can listen to worship music and never be convicted? Do you know why? Because God never purposed for worship music to do, to be the, the, the soul winning tool. Preaching was. I didn't say it, he did. Paul said God chose what? The foolishness of worship singing. No, the foolishness of preaching. <laughs> Are you hearing me here this morning? You see, I, I'm telling you, we've got to, in other words, we've got to make sure the foundation of our lives, transitioning from a good church to a great church, that the foundation is in place and rock solid to build on. Amen. Now, you, here's another one. I, I didn't mean, I'm just going to, this is so heavy in my spirit, I can't get, get it out. I want you to realize as well, get rid of this thought. If this is a thought, let's speak to them out there as well. Get rid of this thought. People will say this. Every one of us has a tendency to make Jesus who we want him to be. Get rid of that. We don't make Jesus. I've heard preachers, I said this the other night, but, but we've had preachers over and over say, Jesus is who you want him to be. Oh, baloney. He is not who you want him to be. He, listen, I must become who he wants me to be. Amen. He's not just, well, I need Jesus to be this and I want Jesus. No, then what happens is we're going to make our own God and form him the way we want him. Oh, no, no, no. This is a king with a kingdom. You must be, I must be molded into him, not him to me. Come on now. We want to be a great church. Then it takes some growing pains. No pain, no gain. <laughs> but guess what? God has good Tylenol to help with the pain. <laughs> Amen. Oh, praise God. Let me, let me, I got to get down to this. My, my, my. You see, we don't want to die with a baton in our hands like Elisha did. And I'm going to get into this with this illustration here in just a moment. Every time that anointing was to be passed on, over and over, when you got to Elijah and the great mantle of power was on him, what happened? He had a protege. He had a, he had a mentee. His name was Elisha that followed him seven to eight years, stayed with him by his side, served him, served him, served him, honored the man of God. Okay? He honored him, served him, honored him in return. What did Elijah do? Elijah poured his life and knowledge and experience into Elisha. Okay? It was a two-way street that was going on. One was a lot of physical, the other one was a lot of spiritual. Now, when, when you get to, <laughs> over there in 2 Kings, now what happens is Elijah's going and Elisha says, I want to be there. Yeah, you need to be there because this mantle is coming off me and it's not going to go to heaven with me. Why? You don't need the anointing to go to heaven. You need the anointing here. The anointing breaks yokes. There's no yokes to be broken in heaven. <laughs> it's already free of that, okay? We need the power of God where? Right here. Now, when that anointing, when he left, what did he do? He took off that mantle, symbolic of the anointing and the gift on his life, and it was what? Transferred to the next generation. Elisha was the next generation. He took the mantle, smote the waters, walked over, and did double the miracles. What? Listen to this. He outdid Elijah in the next generation. That's the way it should have been in the American church from the beginning. Right now, we should be doing more than the last generation. The next generation, if the Lord tarries, should be outdoing us. Do you know what happens? It's the same thing that happened in the Old Testament. Elisha had another protege. He had one, just like he was to Elijah. You know what his name was? Gehazi. Gehazi served him and served him and served him. Listen to this. Until something got in Gehazi's life. What was it? Greed and covetousness. The mantle that was on Elisha was to be transferred to Gehazi and it was to continue on through the Old Testament. 
Do you know what happened? When, in 2 Kings chapter 5, you're going to read the story of Naaman. <laughs> and that story of Naaman was a power, you know it, and the healing of leprosy. It was not a Jew. He was a Syrian general. Now, now notice this. And, and, and this man is healed. And later, uh, Elisha does not demand so much of a payment about it. And here Gehazi decides, I'm going to extort some money out of these people and do it for myself. Do you know what happened? And well, the rest of the story is when he came back, Elisha had discernment. He knew his son, spiritual son. He said, boy, you've got a problem. Something went, you went, my spirit did not go with you. He detected there was something wrong. And he said, as leprosy was on Naaman, it is now going to be on you the rest of your life. The problem was, and you say, we shout over this verse, and it is wonderful. However, the deeper of the, the depth of the story reveals there was a problem. In 2 Kings chapter 13, around the 20, 21 uh, verses area, you're going to read the famous story of the Moabite soldier who was thrown into the grave of Elisha and the bones of Elisha had so much anointing in it, it brought the boy back to life. Do you remember that? And that is a shouting message. At the other side, it's a very sad message. The anointing that was on Elisha was not to die with him. It was to be passed on to the next generation. And instead of being in his bones, it should have been on Gehazi. But because of Gehazi having covetousness and prostituting the anointing, he did not receive it and lost it in his generation. Do you know that has happened in America as well? That now several generations removed from Azusa Street and the power of God that the church is floundering and lost it. You know why? Because we have sought to prostitute the gospel of Jesus Christ for money. <laughs> Come on now. We've got to lose our affection for the dollar and gain it in the treasure trove of God's treasure chest. Amen? There's got to be a transfer of our desire. But as a result of that, it died. You say, well, then how do you get it back? What it takes is, is a people committed and desiring the depth of God. You know what he'll do? He did it in the zoo of the street. He did it in the Welsh Revival. He did it in the 1700s in the Great Awakening. He did it in other periods of history. You know what happened? It's when people made up in their minds, they got together, had a prayer meeting, and prayed until God resurrected that anointing out of that grave again and prayed puts it back on to that group of people and they go out and do great exploits with God. And it's not to die with us, it's to be passed on from us. Amen. The problem is, what are we passing on? <laughs> do you know what a lot of times we're passing on, I'm afraid? I'll tell you what we're good at. <laughs> Immaturity has produced the next generation. How many knows the next generation is always worse than the last? <laughs> It, you start out in Azusa Street, the second generation rode the coattails. The third generation totally lost it. And here we are today. Fourth and fifth generations removed. Think about that. We need the power of Almighty God. But here's what we're good at. We've gotten to a place in the church, we're producing after ourselves, and they're going to be worse and weaker. How do you know this? I'll tell you what we're passing on. We're passing on our complaining attitudes. I'll tell you what we're passing on is our finding fault with everything in church. I'll tell you what we're f passing on, dishonoring of spiritual leadership. That's galling to the American church. Who do you think you are? We don't think we're anybody, but you take it up with God. It's his structure. Come on now. Well, I'll just talk about them behind their back. I'm so disgusted. I want to tell you something. What needs to happen to the American church is have a head-on collision right here. In other words, the church needs to die. <laughs> it needs to lose itself. I ought to go to those verses again. I, I think we better. We just, we better look at it. We better look at it. Uh, turn with me over to Mark chapter 4. The, see, we have passed it on. How do you know that? Because we are those next generations. <laughs> and all we're seeing is gossip, complaining, disgruntledness, no prayer. Do you know why the next generation doesn't pray? Because it never saw its mom and dad pray. Do you know why there's no hunger for the Word of God in this generation? Because mom and dad and grandma and pap didn't have a hunger to read the Bible either. You see, we're, this is not some fluke. It is what we have produced. It is a seed that germinated and is producing bad fruit. But God, right here at MCT, wants to turn that tide around and produce something great. <laughs> Amen. Look at Mark chapter, where did I tell you to go? Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> I 
I'm sorry, uh, Luke 4. Luke. Where did I say? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Mark 8. I was in Mark 4 in another location. Turn to Mark chapter 8. I'm sorry. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I flashed ahead there. <clears throat> and then I've got to get to these fellows down here. They even got a Bible this morning because I brought them out of their seats. Isn't that awful? <clears throat> Mark chapter 8. Now look at this. Look at this. In verse... 31 is where I'm going to begin. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him do what? And take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. We've got to learn to lose our life. Lose it. It means lose our rights to ourselves. Now you say, well, what do you mean by that? Okay, I'm going to give you this. I wasn't going here yet, but I'm going now. A person who has learned to be a disciple, a learner in the school of Christ, has learned how to die and how to lose themselves. How? Let me just give you some quick things real quick. Number one, they will not, if they've learned this in the school of Christ, they do not, doesn't defend themselves when rightly corrected or unjustly attacked. How often does this not happen? This is basic Christianity. People will say, well, I'm telling you, I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm never going back to that church. Whatever happened to the ABCs of Christianity, which is what? Forgiveness. If I can't forgive, I haven't even made it halfway to first base. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Keep concentrated. Listen, what's next? Doesn't lose their temper when under pressure. This is basic Christianity that most do not adhere to. And we wonder why we are not gaining the world and producing a better uh, uh, generation. Do you know what our young generation is seeing today? Christians in name only, but can't even control themselves. Amen. How many Christians lose control in the world and on their job? The least little thing, oh man, I tell you, I get a hold of them, they're going to hear it. Do you know what they should say? Do you know what should happen? you know what that younger generation ought to see? You know what? That hurt me, but I am more than a conqueror. Amen. That hurt me, but I'm going to demonstrate to you, I forgive them, and I'm not even going to talk anymore about it. Amen. Come on now. What are we handing to the next generation? Listen to these things. Look at this next one. Never entertain slander against another human being and sure doesn't spread it. A church will never be great in God's eyes as long as it's turning on each other. Doesn't even entertain it. Doesn't even, doesn't even let it set in the mind. Just gets rid of it. This, what is this? Well, I, well, it's ABCs of Christianity. If this, see, this is to be our character. See, character is the container that maintains proper use of the gifts. Gifts will run amok. You see, a, a person who has gifts with no character is, is like all of this power with no container to contain it. And it just flies all over the place. We have to have the character of Christ. Look at this. Look at this next one. It says, is profoundly teachable and can be corrected easily without justifying or rationalizing themselves. 
How many times? I've said, I'm 17 years of pastoring. I've heard it over and over. And I've heard people, literally people, even say to me and to others, I don't, I remember a lady uh, said this something a couple years ago. Uh, a lady actually said this, and it was one of the only one. But she was one that actually said this. She was living in a place that needed corrected in her life. I didn't single her out. I didn't even think about it. I mean, it wasn't, I was just preaching. And the word hit her life. Do you know what the word she said after that service was? She stood up, pointed at the pulpit, and said, and she was in the wrong. She was living in a sinful state. The Bible's trying to correct her. She said, I don't care what comes across that pulpit. And she did was not going to yield to it. And you say, well, well, why? Well, that's her right. No. When you get to the cross, whatever the word says is uh, applicable to my life, and I don't have a right to disobey it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, the American church says we can pick and choose and vote on whatever we want and, and, and what we like, but if we're going to be a great church, we've got to say, you know what? I need to be teachable, which requires humility in my life. I mean, I've preached on things over and over, and, and people, I've seen it. I've preached on, you know, living together. I don't know about, <laughs> the Bible is very explicit. Living together without being married is a damnable sin. <laughs> Okay, you can, it's not, I've preached on over the years. You'd be surprised. People say, well, he ain't telling me what to do. Amen. And you know what happens? If they die in that state, they're going to wish the longest day of their eternal life they would not have been stiff-necked towards the Word of God. Amen. It's the Word. It's, I, you can't change it. We have to be teachable. Well, <laughs> and here's another thing. You know, if we want to be a great church, we have to just sacrifice our own opinions at times. Yes. People say, well, I'll tell you what, that's not the way I would do it. No, maybe it's not, but can you live with it? Let's just move on. <laughs> I'm afraid we talk more than we want to really do. Doesn't find it difficult to say, I'm sorry and I was wrong. <sighs> I might as well just keep moving on. Is it, I gotta get, I'm not even to the day's message yet. When spoken evil against remains silent and even returns good for evil. When was the last time that happens in most churches and most people that says I'm a Christian? Most of the time when they're spoken evil against, they turn around and trash that person. Amen. You know a very practical way, and I've said it in the past, if somebody on your job does you terrible, wait to the break room, buy them an M&M. &M. I ain't buying them nothing. No, overcome it. You're dead at the cross. Go to that thing and say, hey, I was just thinking about you. Here's, a, here's some M&Ms. I just wanted to bless you. You know what you're doing? You're obeying the Bible. Yes. Do you know what's going to happen? You have just influenced them, shamed them by thinking the, and saying what they did about you. Amen. He said you'll heap coals of fire on their head. <laughs> but do it in the right spirit. Don't do it and say, well, I'll show them now. <laughs> That's the wrong attitude. Always do truth in love. <laughs> Be genuine. <laughs> takes the high road, but under the gun. <laughs> when there's high pressure on your life, always take the high road. Don't sacrifice and compromise. You know why? The greatest enemy of your character is compromise. That's why Satan spends so much time trying to get people to compromise. Because if he can ruin the character, he ruins their usefulness in God. The moment I lose my character is the moment I lose the right to operate the gifts God has given me. I can still operate them, but I don't have the legal right given by God to do it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is, this is powerful stuff for us this morning. Well, sacrifice themselves and their egos for others. We lay our lives down so others can live. <laughs> Treat other people the same way they want to be treated in every situation. In every situation. How would you put yourself in their shoes and then say, now, how would I treat myself? How do I expect to be treated? If I wouldn't do that to myself, then don't do it to them. <laughs> if you don't like being talked about, don't talk about them. <laughs> Boy, it's getting quiet. I can feel the air just going out through that vent. But just stay with me here. There's more. Okay? If there's ever a time in your life to deny yourself and lose, it's when you feel someone has hurt your feelings. <laughs> Boy, I didn't think I'd get many amens. You see, this is practical Christianity. We talk about, oh, we're saved. We're this and that. All right, okay, do we live it? <laughs> If when somebody corrects you in Christ, but you don't wish to receive that correction or don't understand it, at the cross, we lose ourselves. <laughs> It's when someone strongly disagrees, how do I react to that? Think about some of these things. It's each case when the cross seeks to do its deep, deepest work in our lives. Christians who take offense actually resist the cross. 
Let this stuff sink into our minds. If I am allowed to become offended, I have resisted the effects of the cross in my life. That means I'm not dead, I'm alive. And he's dead in my life. Okay? Now, you ready to move on? <laughs> Boy, I, t I, I spent all that time, and I'm just now getting to where we need to be this morning. Now, these fellas, I'm going to use them. As I said, the greatest need of the American church, and I still firmly believe this, is growth and maturity. How to achieve a lasting legacy. My job as a pastor, a shepherd, is to direct people to personally depend on the Holy Spirit and develop a personal relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. That's my number one job as a pastor. Now, I'm going to use these fellows. Harold, Brother Harold should come up. Now, the reason why I'm using him is Jesus is because he really shines, and I want him to be Jesus. I want you to come over here and stand. I want you to look at us, and you just come over here about where Bev is. Turn around, look at us over here. Over this way, look this way. There you go. All right, now. All right, Jordan, get up, get up here. Now, let's see. Oh, I about need another one, too, then. Uh, Donnie, come here a minute. Uh, I'll need another. You just stay there a minute, Ryan, and uh, let's see. Uh, you come and sit here, Donnie. I want you to sit right here because we're going to come to you in just a little bit. And then I'm going to come to... Yeah, I'll come to... Ryan, just scoot over here a little bit, okay? That way, a little bit more space. I, that way I'll come back to you. Now, all right, Jordan. <clears throat> Man, I used, to, I used to be strong like this. <laughs> well, up here, I mean. <laughs> I, you know what I meant. But anyhow... What is my job as a pastor? Now, let's say Jordan, and he did, you know, some time ago, he got saved and Christ come into his heart. He's a young man. He's that next generation. Here he is. <clears throat> I had this incident, not with him, but one of our other young fellows this week. Had a great, great time in, in mentoring and discipling one of our other younger fellows in, in the church this week. And it was just awesome. And I wanted to use it as an illustration. Let me use Jordan here representing this. And he gets saved, and I'm pastor. Where, where should I be in location to his life as pastor? Now that he's just born again, is as a shepherd, I should be right near him. Amen. Right here, right here. Now, just like this young man, and I'm going to use him, this fellow. Now let's say, he calls me up, and I'm here. He calls me up, and he gives me a question. and says, uh, Pastor Ruben, I'm struggling here today. And that's all right. We understand immaturity and so forth. Let's say just coming out of the gate and there's going to be some weak things in the life needs to develop. We understand that. And so we'll take that time. We're here. We're here. And he says to me, uh, Pastor Ruben, I've, ha I've got a problem today. And uh, I mean, it's really something. Not sin. He's not falling into immorality or anything. But it's something that is really bothering his spiritual life. And he says, you know, what, what should I do? And as a shepherd, here is the worst thing that I can do for him is to simply say to him, Jordan, I'll be praying for you. And then that's it. Amen. Do you know what I've done? Amen. My job is always put his attention to Jesus. Amen. But what I've just done, when I just said, I'll pray for you, prayer's good, but it can't, it can't end there. There's more to this. If I just tell him, Jordan, I'll, just, I'll be praying for you, do you know what I've done? I have turned his attention towards me. Now, on down the road, when he has another problem, what's he going to do? He hasn't learned how to develop his faith. All he knows is, call pastor. The next thing you know, we're walking together, and I can't leave his side, not because of him, but because I have stunted his growth. Now, let's back up again. Here is what I did this week, and this is what we should do. He comes to me and says the same scenario, same problem. I didn't just say it, I will be praying. But I didn't just say, Jordan, I'll be praying for you. You know what I did? I opened my Bible. I gave principles and understanding and taught. And I said to the young know, you know, man, we're using Jordan, and to, I'll use him. But Jordan, this is what needs to be done in your life and this exercise in your life and in prayer and so forth. I gave him principles. What have I just done? I have just given him principles and keys, kept his focus on Jesus, and all I've done is given him tools to exercise and develop his own personal relationship. After a while, let's keep walking. 
Oh, real slow, just walking. After a while, he stops again. I give him more principles, more development. And he's exercising. He's working it. After a while, we never lose our relationship, but my relationship changes to him. Now, just walk real slow. After a while, he keeps walking. Where's he going? Towards Christ, deeper in his experience. Now, you stop right there just a moment, Jordan. He continues to walk, and here he is. He's getting closer to Christ. Where am I? I'm no longer right by his side. Why? Because <laughs> he has learned to walk his own walk with Christ. Amen. He doesn't need me every five minutes. Amen. No. Now what's he going to do? Is it just him alone? No. He should reach a point. This is where Brother Donnie comes in. Just turn towards Brother Donnie. And now he finds others to get saved. And now, what does he do? He gets Donnie, come on up, Donnie gets saved, and now he is mature in Christ. Now they go together, all right, just stay on side by side, and now they go together, and what I've taught him, now he takes and teaches this one. Are you getting this? Why is this so important? Come here, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, boy, I'm glad he finally got saved. And here he is. <laughs> what happened now? What if I'm still walking with Jordan? There are other people getting saved. But he, immature, won't grow up. Let's flip it. Boy, I'm really getting on him now. He won't grow up. But this, most of Christians, won't, they refuse to grow up because of laziness, Amen. irresponsibility. And if he demands my attention all the time, do you know what happens? this man will suffer because I can't properly attend to those who need it because I'm, I'm too busy changing a 40-year-old's diapers. <laughs> Go ahead and say it. That's disgusting. You better believe it is. It is disgusting, and it is even to a pastor who realizes where people should be further along, and you say, my goodness, what? Oh, this is disgusting, putting a binky and parting the hairs to get it in. That's bad. What happens is, Jordan's expectation is, I have a responsibility. I must teach him. I must disciple him. But after a while, God expects him. Now, boy, you've exercised these principles. You continue to walk. But now it's just not you. Now you go and you get people and you help disciple them too. Now I go back to Ryan and I come back to him. And now I repeat the process with Ryan. And now I walk with him a while. Same things. He'll face the same things Jordan did. I just walk along with him. After a while, I ease up a little bit. I kind of cut that string a little bit. He just keeps walking a little bit, keeps going. Next thing, he repeats the process, and he gets somebody. He helps disciple them. Look at this. Look at this. You want to talk about church growth? That's the way it should be growing. Yes. Now, come here, Ryan. Back up again. <laughs> but let's say... <laughs> If he does not grow to that place, let's say right, he does not grow to this place in Christ. Do you know what eventually will happen to him? <laughs> He's going to become nothing more than a critical, fault-finding, miserable individual who says, I'm a Christian and does nothing for the kingdom. Let that settle in. Do you know what's sad? That's probably three-fourths of the American church. We pay the pastor to do it all just so he can deal with it. We ain't worried about it. And go to work every day. Don't ever witness about anything. Don't disciple anybody. And they've been supposedly serving Christ for 30 years, 20 years, whatever, even 10 years. Honey, I want to tell you something. In three years, according to Paul in the book of Acts, in three years, people were supposed to be mature enough to go disciple other people. Amen. Three years. If I'm... 10 years and I have trouble doing any of that, then there's something that I'm doing that's stunting my growth. We don't want to just be a good church. We want to be a great church that is impacting people's lives. Amen. And we can't just one person do it or two people, even three. It engages everybody doing their part for God. Are you with me here this morning? I tell you, we can take it. All right, fellas, I'll let you sit down. Boy, isn't that a good looking Jesus there coming, huh? <laughs> He just shines in the, in the world. <laughs> but you see, uh, this is... <laughs> what does 
as these guys are sitting down, let me just share. I, my goodness, i got to get on the caboose here. And we're just now getting started. What is required of Jordan and Ryan to grow? What is required of them to grow? Think about this. Number one, and we've already went by some of it. Number one is he, them, have to remain teachable. They have to remain humble. They have to remain in the understanding it's never about them. It's always about Jesus. I'm going to say something now. It's going to really spin you up, but I'm going to say it anyhow because it is truth, and I won't back off of it. It's true, and it's not about me. It is about God's position. I will tell you what will ensure their growth as well. It's number two, and it's a close number two. They must, if they want to continue to grow, they must, I'm going to say it, they must honor me as pastor. Amen. <laughs> or any pastor. Because the moment a pastor is dishonored, God sees it and cuts it off. It's, it's, <laughs> it's called rebellion. God has that chain of position and he demands it be honored. I'm sorry I have to preach it and it sounds like I'm, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. It is either or. If, as long as they honor me as pastor, what does that mean? As long as they honor me as pastor, they're able to receive from me. The moment they dishonor me, they've cut the spigot off and they'll receive no more. Oh, they'll hear me preach, but nothing gets in here. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Honor, when I honor somebody, what have I done? The moment I honor a person, I've esteemed them, means I've set them up, I've honored them. What does it mean to honor? It means that I have given, if I honor Brother Butch, if I honor him in leadership position, I honor him. When he speaks, I have given him access to influence my heart. If I dishonor him, I've shut off the access. No matter what he says, I will not yield to it. That's how important honor is. Think about that. <laughs> Number three. They must, Jordan and Ryan must, must not only hear, not only what I say or anybody says, as long as the scriptural truth, but they must put into practice the keys and the principles of the Bible. They can't just talk about it, they must do it. Doing evidences to God, you believe what you're saying. Okay? As long as they do it, as long as they put it into practice, they have just ensured future growth. Here's a number, num number four. Ryan and Jordan, again, using these fellows, they must learn to always remain humble in this sense as well and cry out for help if they feel they are being overwhelmed. Amen. Are you hearing me? Peter on the water that day, slid down and was going to drown. Now, we know Jesus would agree. He wouldn't have let him drown. But think of it. Just play along. What did Peter do? What was the initial reaction? Save me. <laughs> he hollered out, I'm in trouble. Anytime a young person is growing, has to remain humble in the sense, the next generation as well, in all of us, if we're in trouble, we've got to cry out. That way, somebody can come and help. But here's what pride does. I don't want anybody to know I'm in trouble. And what happens is, bubbles come up and they drown. Amen. I would rather, honey, even if it's embarrassment, I'd rather be embarrassed than die. Are you, aren't you glad you came on this Sunday morning? Huh? You see, get Wednesday night, don't forget it. You see, <laughs> Eventually, these guys will disciples, d disciple others. And in the fault-finding range, if they don't do these things necessarily necessary to grow, they will find fault. They won't win anybody to Christ. Do you know that, what is it? Well, the other day we saw this on Facebook, uh, guys, I put it or something. Was it 1% of the church actually wins people to Christ? Or 3% 3, 3 of the church in America, only 3% of its people ever win anybody. In a lifetime, isn't it? I think it was in a lifetime, ever win somebody to Christ. They won't win anybody to Christ. 
They'll always have a problem. Listen to this. If these guys, I'm using them, I hope they don't mind, but I'm using this as younger generation. If they're, how will they grow? Let me tell you something. If they don't grow, do you know what they'll become? They'll always have a problem with the church that they're in. I put that on the end for a reason. Because it doesn't matter what church we go to, we'll find fault with it if we get in that condition. Amen. Well, I'm over here. You know, it's kind of the, we talked about this the other day. It's the Liz Taylor syndrome. <laughs> Some of you get this. Liz Taylor was married how many times? <laughs> huh? Seven or eight. It was seven or eight, wasn't it? Seven or eight times. And do you know she never took the blame? <laughs> she married one old Burton, I think, what, twice. <laughs> Poor guy, I pitied him so bad. And, you know, and she, she married seven or eight times. You know what she always said? It was always their fault. I don't care if she'd have married 20 guys. That would always have been their fault. You know why? Because she would never look in the mirror and say, Liz, you're the problem. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when people hop around churches all the time, here, there, and everywhere. Just go on, go on, go on. And everywhere they go, boy, there's a problem. There's a problem. Can't take it. There's a problem. Do you know what it really is? They need to go look in the mirror and say, maybe I'm the problem. Eventually, Jordan and Ryan, if they would do this, or they're not, I'm just using them as illustrations, but eventually they'll become indifferent to the things of God. Oh boy. And they're going to want attention. And they'll live from tragedy to tragedy. Every time you see them, in church, out of church, how you doing? Oh. You know what they want? Attention. Look at me, pity me. Oh, oh, how you doing? Oh, they got the O's. You see them at food line, how you doing? Oh, in church, amazing grace. After it's all done, how you doing? Oh, they need delivered from the demon of O's. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just throwing. You realize after a while, they'll get to that place that all they want is the problem. The devil perverts things to the point that we'll start wanting things from people that only Christ can truly fulfill. When you realize you really have the attention of Christ, you don't worry about others paying attention. <laughs> oh, man, I'm trying to get... I can't even finish this. There's no way. Can I just give you... How many minutes do we have left back there? Five minutes. Let me just... Can I show you, can you handle a little bit more before we choke on chicken and mashed potatoes? Is it all right? Just come on, I want to give you one more thing. Look at Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter 4. And then we're done. I really expected somebody to shout amen right there when I said that, but that's all right. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4. And everything that I'm saying today as well, this, I'm saying this to me. I prayed and God, <laughs> He talked to me as well. So it's not putting, you know, condescending here or anything. Don't receive it like that. I, this is applicable to me and I'm applying it to myself as well in the growth aspect. We're all in this together. In Luke chapter 4, and you'll read here from verses 18 to 30. Now, I'm not going to... Boy, how can I do this? I was going to read it all, but... Uh, chapter 4, verse 18, when you have Jesus standing up in the synagogue that day, and he preaches out of, over there in Psalm 61, verse 1 and 2, and preaches the gospel of the poor, and something to heal the brokenhearted, and then verse 19, preaches the acceptable year of the Lord, it's the year of Jubilee, over the Leviticus, and etc. Then he closes the book in verse 20, and all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now look at this. In verse 22, and all, everybody here, Bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words were spewed out of his mouth. And they said, it's not this Joseph. Now look at this. In verse 22, I mean, it was like, wow, whoa, who is this? Man, this is anointed. This is gracious. This is powerful. And one time they said, man, he speaks with authority. He don't even talk like the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, this guy, wow, what a preacher. What a minister of the gospel. And then they kind of said, well, but then again, isn't this Joseph's son? Now, there goes the honor level down, okay? Uh, then Jesus goes into ministering, which is interesting, 
And he goes into ministering that a prophet is not accepted in his own country because they just dishonored him. After they honored him, then they kind of killed him by saying, well, isn't this Joseph's son? They reduced him down. And so they begin to close it off. And he said, look, he said, no prophet is accepted in, in, his, accepted in his own country. And he really goes through a litany of things here that is so powerful. But for the constraint of time, we're going to verse 28. Look at verse 28 with me. And all they in the synagogue, this is the same group of people. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up. And they wanted to throw him off a cliff and kill him. These are the same people in verse 22. Their opinion changed within about five minutes from loving him to hating him. I'm going somewhere with this. You even see it at the end of Jesus in his life. You have people laying down uh, uh, palm branches crying Hosanna that the Lord cometh and worshiping him as king. Within days, they're the same people saying crucify him. Yes. Want to be a great church? Here we go. Don't allow people's fickle opinions to determine your mission or destiny in this life. I want you to think about that. Everybody's got an opinion. Don't live by them. Live by the truth of his word. Jesus moved out of Nazareth and put his headquarters in Capernaum. And the reason was this. Two, one, one thing really. Honor. Nazareth rejected him and said, he ain't nobody. And they wouldn't hear him anymore. He went to Capernaum totally different opinion of him. They honored him and many people were healed and saved. Same message, same messenger, simply different response of people and their opinions. Don't live your lives on somebody's opinions. I have this happen and I'm going to have to just shut up and just, we're just going to walk away from this and come back and I'll get the rest of it to you. I just had this happen. If I, as a pastor ministering, if I lived by people's opinions, I would be popping Prozac and in a home somewhere lo losing my mind. I'm going to give you just what happened. Within the last two weeks, I've had an individual or individuals who had said, basically, basically saying that I'm, I'm a terrible pastor and, and, and can't stand the ministering and preaching and this and that and the other thing. Now that could have drove me into a humdrum and think, oh, Lacey, I'm just, this is so bad. And then come to yesterday, this is how fickle people's opinions are. And you can't trust one person's opinion. Go by the truth. If I was going by people's opinion, yesterday I was paid the highest compliment I've ever had in my life by a person at a business as I was at who watches Experience Life today. Blew my mind what that individual said. Doesn't go to this church, goes to their own, but never misses Experience Life today every Sunday morning from 9 to 10. Never misses it. They feed off of it. Paid me the highest compliment. We drove away. Except